Bobby Figueroa and uh, welcome back to the ComSci 201 lecture series. This is session 5 and uh, we will be talking about proving and propositional logic. So in this session we will be talking about the rules of inference, the laws of equivalence. I'll be teaching you how to prove via chain of reasoning, contradiction, and finally resolution. Before we proceed with the details, I want to first define what an argument is. An argument is an attempt to persuade. It has two parts, the premise and the conclusion. Looks familiar? Of course, because this is just an implication. So how do you say that an implication is valid? Do you remember the truth table for an implication? Here it is, right? So for an implication, for every true premise, there should be a true conclusion. The only time that an implication becomes false or becomes invalid is if the premise is true and the conclusion is false. So how can you prove that an argument is valid? Since it's an implication, then for every true premise of an argument, the conclusion should also be true. And how can you say that all of the conclusions are true for true premises? You use a truth table, right? In other words, the truth table should show that it is a tautology. So how do you do that for all of the cases, for all arguments? What if the argument has 32 or 5 or 6 variables? We know that to construct a truth table from the number of variables, you have to use the formula 2 raised to n, where n is the number of variables. So what if the argument has five propositions or five variables? Then you will have to construct 32 rows for a table, for a truth table. And that's very daunting. That's the reason why there are established rules that were already proven using truth tables or proven before and are already laws and rules for you to use to prove a complex argument. And these are the rules of inference and the laws of equivalence. So first, let's talk about the rules of inference. Here they are. The first is addition. Addition just states that if P, therefore P or Q. So whatever just says that if the premise is P for every premise, then you can conclude the same premise with any, any other proposition that are in disjunction with it. And the book clearly explains why this is so. Because if P is true, then anything that you put with P as a conclusion will not make it false, right? So if P is true, then the conclusion is true, then it's valid. Can this, is it possible for this expression to have true and false? If P is true, is it possible for P or Q to be false? No. That's the only time that this expression will be invalid. Hence, this is valid. What about simplification? Simplification is for a conjunction P and Q. You can conclude either P or Q. You can also conclude Q from P and Q. What about conjunction? For P and Q, you can conclude P and Q. So here's an example of a truth table to prove the validity of a certain rule of inference. So we will be using addition. So as I've told you before, when you construct a truth table for a two variable argument, then you will have to have two raised to two rows. So that's four. So for P and Q, true, true, false, false. For Q, true, false, true, false. The premise is P, so you'll just have to copy 
the values for the first column onto the third column. And for the conclusion, you just have to get uh, the disjunction of P and Q. So P or Q, true or true is true, true or false is true, false or true is true, and both false. If uh, using the disjunction will yield to false. So that's true, 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 false, true, false. So is this done? No. We have to use an implication first, right? Because this is if P, then P or Q. Now we will see the value for P, therefore P or Q. The only time that an implication becomes false is when the premise is true and the conclusion is false. So for this set, true implies true is true. This set true implies true is true. This set false implies true is true and false implies false is true. Therefore, this is a tautology. And when you say that a given truth table is a tautology, then the argument that it represents is valid, correct. That's why addition is valid. And you can use it to prove the other rules of inference to convince yourself. Okay, how about modus ponens? Modus ponens just says that if there is an implication, P implies Q, and uh, you end a P, you end the premise with it, then you can conclude the conclusion. So if there is an implication, P implies Q, and it's it has a conjunction with the premise, then you can conclude the conclusion of the former implication. What about modus tollens? For modus tollens, if there's an implication P implies Q, if it's ended with the negation of the conclusion, you can conclude the negation of the premise. How about disjunctive syllogism? For disjunctive syllogism, if there's a disjunction P or Q, and it is in conjunction with the negation of one of them, any of them, then you can conclude the affirmative of the other. So what if it's in conjunction with not Q? Then you can conclude the affirmative of P. Right. What about hypothetical syllogism? Hypothetical syllogism just states that if there's an implication P implies Q, and it is in conjunction with another implication, Q implies R. If the conclusion of the former implication is the premise of the next implication, then we can merge the two. We can conclude the premise of the first implying the conclusion of the second. This is also called transitivity. So P implies Q and Q implies R implies, or therefore, P implies R. What about constructive dilemma? Constructive dilemma just states that if there are two implications, P implies Q and R implies S, if you have a conjunction with a disjunction, of the former two's premises, P or R, then we can conclude a disjunction of the conclusions of the former implications, Q or S. Again, if there are two implications that are conjugated, P implies Q and R implies S, and there is a statement here where the two premises, P and R, are in disjunction, then we can conclude the disjunction of their conclusions, Q or S. That's constructive dilemma. This is somewhat like modus ponens. So what about destructive dilemma? Destructive dilemma is pretty similar to modus tollens. So it's about two 
implications, P implies Q and R implies S. And if another premise is the disjunction of the negation of the conclusions, then we can conclude the disjunction of the negation of their premises. That is destructive dilemma, which is, as you can see, just a more complicated version of modus tollens. And if you want to prove their validity, you're free to do so by using a truth table. Uh, personally, I don't really use constructive dilemma and destructive dilemma in uh, proving. I think the other ones are already enough, but these are actually for convenience because if you see this pattern, it's actually hard to prove the validity of this pattern using the other rules of inference. So it'll be convenient for you as well to memorize this if you want to. Okay, what about the laws of equivalence? So the laws of equivalence, if the rules of inference uh, pertain to implications, the laws of equivalence pertain to uh, biconditionals or if and only if. So the first law is reflexivity, P if and only if P. So this is self-explanatory. Most of these are very familiar with you, especially those who took algebra. Double negation is just like double negative 1, right? Double negative x. So a double negation is not not p, is just equivalent to p. What about commutativity? Commutativity deals with arrangement. So for, it just states that for propositions that are in disjunction with one another or in conjunction with one another, or that are equivalent to one another, then arrangement is not really an issue. So that's commutativity. So P and Q is equal to or equivalent to Q and P. P or Q is equivalent to Q or P. P if and only if Q is equivalent to Q if and only if P. Associativity is about grouping. So if there are propositions that have the same that are ended together and that are or together or are equivalent to one another, then grouping does not matter. So, by the way, this is a correction from the book because I think uh, the book forgot to put the equivalent symbol here. So please note these. So for example, P and Q and R is just equivalent to P and Q and R. For this, is a quantity P or Q or R is just equivalent to P or quantity Q or R. And uh, for P, if and only if Q, uh, quantity P, if and only if Q, if and only if R, it's equivalent to P, if and only if, quantity Q, if and only if R. What about distributivity? It's just really like um, algebra, right? So P and Q or R is just equivalent to P and Q or P and R. So you distribute and over Q and R, and then for the two terms, you will connect them with an OR. So distribute P and and to Q and R, and then connect the two terms with an OR, which is this one. Again, let's see the, the process for the, the other example. P OR, quantity Q and R, so you distribute P and OR to Q, so let's do that, P let's distribute P and or to Q and to R. So that's P or Q, P or R, and then connect them with the symbol inside the parenthesis, which is end. So that's how you do it. In this example, you distribute P and to Q, 
into R. So that's why that's P and Q, P and R, and then connect these two terms with an OR, with a symbol inside the parentheses. Okay, so let's go to the next terms. So what about this? Idempotency. Idempotency is very self-explanatory. P and P is just P, equivalent to P. P or P is just equivalent to P. Identity, P and T is equivalent to P. Why? Because anything that you end with true is itself, is P. Because if P is false, then this will be false. If P is true, then this will be true. That's the law of and. What about or? P or F, or anything that is or with F is that proposition. Because if P is true, then true or false is true. If P is false, false or false is false. That's why it's identity. What about inverse? So if a proposition a proposition is ended or is conjugated with its negation, P, then it yields a false. Because there will be no way that this will be both true, right? The rule for a conjunction for an end is that both propositions should be true. What about an OR? The rule for an OR is that both propositions should be a false in order to, for it to be false. So it's impossible for this statement to be both false because it's a disjunction of a proposition and its negation. That's why it's always true. What about dominance? Dominance is the dominance of a truth value. So for P and false, it's impossible for this to be both true. So false dominates. What about P or true? It's impossible for this to be false because anything that is, uh, because uh, an or should have both false for it to be false. So truth, true dominated in this case. That's why it's called dominance. What about absorption? So absorption has two qualities. First is the quantity inside, the, uh, the operator inside is different from the operator outside. So if, it's, if this is an OR, then the one outside should be an END. So as you can see in the second example, the one outside is an OR, and then the one inside is an END. So it looks like a distribution to you, but it's really not. So the second thing that you will notice is that there's a proposition here that is similar to the, preposi the proposition inside the parentheses. So if the proposition outside has something similar inside, then the rule of absorption or the law of absorption states that everything inside this quantity will be absorbed by the one outside. That's why P is the one that stayed. What about this? It's the same, right? There's an end here inside, there's an or outside, there's a P here outside, and one of the propositions inside the, par the parenthesis is P. So everything here inside this parenthesis, th this set of parentheses will be absorbed by the one outside. That's why it's P. So just to convince yourself, here is another truth table. So as you can see here, for P, false, false, true, true, and for Q, false, true, false, true, so this is a different way of stating the truth table, false, false, true, true, false, true, false, true, the or for P or Q is false or false, false, false or true, true, true or false, true, true or true, false, so this is the or. And then you end it, you end this with this one. So let me use my pen. You, you end this, oops, sorry, with this one. 
So if you end it, then false, false, false and false is false, false and true is false, true and true is true, true and true is true. So this is the left side of the equivalence, false, false, true, true. Now this is the right side of the equivalence, P, false, false, true, true. As you can see, for each row here, and on the left side, you can see that the one at the right side is equivalent to it. So if the left side is false, the right side is false. So as, this is it. This is the symbol. Okay. If this is false, then the right side is false. If this is true, the right side is true. If this is true, the right side is true. Do you remember the rule for equivalence? Right, for equivalence, the one at the right side and the one at the left side should be should have the same value for it to be true. So this is true, this is true, this is true, and this is true. And what do we have? We have another tautology. So that's proven. If you want to prove the other uh, loss of equivalence, you can use the same process. Again, for proving the loss, the rules of inference. You use a, a tautology for an implication, but for the loss of equivalence, you use a tautology for uh, for a biconditional or for an equivalence. Okay, so let's continue. This is another correction, the De Morgan's law. I think um, you have to you have to update the book by by replacing it with this. So if De Morgan's law just states that if there is a, a negation that's distributed over a P and a Q, then if you distribute it, it will first reverse the it will reverse the operator from an N to an OR, and then it, you can now distribute the not. So it will be not P or not Q. So it's the same thing here, not quantity P or Q. You first reverse the operator, it will now become an end, and then you can dis distribute the, the not. It'll be not P and not Q. What about contrapositive? If you try to reverse an implication, then the reverse should be the negation of the former conclusion and the former premise. So the former conclusion will be the new negated premise and the former premise will be the new negated conclusion. Material implication just states that an implication is equivalent to the negation of its premise that has a disjunction with the affirmative of its conclusion. So P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q. And this can be the other way around. So if it's P or Q, then it is also equivalent to not P implies Q. It's the same. What about material equivalence? Material equivalence just states that a biconditional, a P if and only if Q, is equivalent to the conjunction of P implies Q and Q implies P. And exportation, which I rarely, rarely use. I don't know if you'll be using it in the future, but it's still useful for you to know this. It's quantity P and Q implies R. It's equivalent to P implies Q implies R. So what can you see here? If there are two premises that are conjugated with each other, P and Q, so if P and Q are the premises for the conclusion R, then we can say that P, we can export out one of the one of the premises, P, and it will become the premise for the conclusion which contains the other premise. Q implies R. So that is exportation. Now we use the rules of inference and the, and the laws of equivalence to prove a certain argument, right?
There are three ways to prove that an argument is valid, aside from using the truth table. First, we can use chain of reasoning. Chain of reasoning is also called direct proof, which starts from the premises, and using the rules of inference and the laws of equivalence, you aim to arrive at the conclusion. So here's an example. The example is from your SAQ 2-3. So let's try to prove this using chain of reasoning. Not E implies not R, not S. These are the premises. E implies W, R, or S. So these are all, imagine that these are all ended together like that. And the conclusion is W or not S. So let, let me try that. You imagine that there is an and. These are all ended together. And the conclusion is this one. So how do you use chain of reasoning to prove it? So let, let us do it step by step. First, we put not E implies not R as a premise. So actually, there are many ways to do this. This is the uh, this is the method that was described in the book. Next, what was done was a contrapositive. So I just used CP, so that'll be shorter. So you can also use that. I will know that it's contrapositive. Contrapositive is the reverse of this. We negated not R. So actually, it's not just contrapositive. It's contrapositive and double negation, right? Because it's not not R implies not not E. So we, we have to also put double negation. D and N for number one. We use double negation and contrapositive. And then we state E implies W, which is a premise, so we can use that. And then we use hypothetical syllogism to 2 and 3. So R implies E, E implies W. So that will be R implies W. Hypothetical syllogism or transitivity. You can use either term. And we now use not S as a premise. So here's a correction. It should be R or S. I think in the book it was R or W or something like that. So it should be R or S. That's the premise. It's obvious that it's a correction. And then R. How did we get R? We used disjunctive syllogism to 5 and 6. So as you can see, there's a negation of one of these. So if there's a negation of one of these, then we can get the affirmative of the other, which is R. So we're nearly there. What can we do next? So as you can see here, we can use modus ponens. There's this implication. And there's R. So according to modus ponens, 4 and 7, if you get the affirmative of the premise, then you can also get the affirmative or conclude the affirmative of the conclusions. So as you can see here, the final, the final answer is W or not S because we used addition to number 8. Addition states that for a premise W or P, you can conclude, you can conclude it with a disjunction of any other variable or proposition. So since we need not s, then we put not s here, and it's still valid. Therefore, this is proven to be valid using chain of reasoning. OK. As I've said a while ago, there are many ways to solve this. It's actually nice because you can be creative about it. As said before, uh, logic is not just a science, it's also an art. So we call this discarte in Tagalog. It's up to you, it's up to your methodology. I used the 
premise for the first step, E implies W, and then I used contrapositive to number one, which is not W implies not E, and then I used the other premise, not R implies not, not E implies not R, and then I used hypothetical syllogism to two and three, which is also transitivity, not W implies not E, and not E implies not R is actually not W implies not R. And then I used the other premise, R or S. Then used material implication, I converted this into not R implies S. After that, I used hypothetical syllogism to 4 and 6. Not W implies not R and not R implies S is actually not W implies S. After that, I got the premise not S. So it's now obvious that you can use modus tollens here. Modus tollens is actually, since this is the negation of the conclusion, then I can get the negation of the premise. So not, not W using modus tollens on 7 and 8, and then using double negation on 9, this is W. As what we did a while ago in the previous uh, method of proof, we can use addition to just put not S. Simple, right? So maybe you have another way of solving this. As long as it arrives to the conclusion and you've used valid rules of inference and laws of equivalence, then you will be okay. Now there's another uh, method of proof that you can use to prove the validity of an argument. It's proof by contradiction. Proof by contradiction assumes that all premises are true and that the conclusion is false. So after that, after assuming that the conclusion is false, then we try to derive a contradiction by adding the conclusion as a premise. So a contradiction is of the form R and not R. So here are the steps. First, negate the conclusion, and then add that negated conclusion as a premise. And by using the rules of inference and laws of equivalence, you can derive a contradiction. So let's look at this example. P implies R and Q. R implies not Q. Therefore, P implies R. How do we prove the validity of this example using contradiction? First, we negate this conclusion. So the negated conclusion is not quantity P implies R. So now that we negated the conclusion, we will manipulate it and we will try to convert it first into an OR. So we use material implication inside it's not P or R. And then we will try to distribute the not by using De Morgan's rule or De Morgan's law. It's not not P and so as you can see here we tried to get the opposite of OR. Now it's an AND and not R. And then we we use double negation that will so so not not p will become p that will now be p and not r and we can simplify p and not r now we're ready for uh, the other premises p implies r and q so what do we do here so now we see that P is a premise for this implication, so we can conclude the conclusion. That's why it's R and Q, using modus ponens on 5, on P, and this implication on 7. And now that we have R and Q, we can also simplify R. So now that we have an R, and we have this negation of R here, we have found a contradiction. By using, by using a conjunction R and not R, 
we now know that this is a contradiction and this is the end of proof. Actually, you can end here at number nine and you will just say that not R and R are inverse or they're a contradiction. So this is the end of proof for proof by contradiction. What about proof by resolution? A proof by resolution is actually a proof by contradiction that uses the resolution rule. So this is a new rule. So what is the resolution rule? The resolution rule states that if P or Q and R or not Q, then we can eliminate these two, Q and not Q, and P or Q will be the one to be left. That's proof, uh, that's the resolution rule. Now if you want to prove it, then as I've said before, you can use the truth table. And uh, you will just have to find the tautology for an implication. So how, what are the steps for proof by resolution? First, negate the conclusion and add it as a premise. So it's a proof by contradiction as well. And then this is the additional step. Convert all premises to conjunctive normal form. So what is CNF? It's just a conjunction of disjunctions. Or it's an end of ors. And then we derive a contradiction. We try to find another contradiction using a resolution diagram. So let's do that. How do you convert premises into CNF? First, you remove the equivalences. You convert them into implications. And then you remove the implications. You convert them into ors by using material implication. And then you reduce the scope of not. That means that as much as possible, there should not be parentheses. So what do you do? You distribute this using either De Morgan's law or double negation. And then you separate clauses joined by an end by using simplification. And distribute all ors that are over end. So distribute ors over ends so that it'll be converted into ends of ors. It's so hard to imagine if I just uh, explain these steps here. So let me give you the example for SAQ 2-3. For SAQ 2-3, this is the example P. These are the premises P. P and Q implies R. Q or S implies Q. S therefore R. First step is to negate the conclusion here. And then we try to convert all premises to CNF or conjunctive normal form. So let's, this is already okay. This is P, this is S, this negative R is already okay. So we just have to convert the other two. So let's look at this first one. P and Q implies R. First we use material implication that's not quantity P and Q or R, and then we use De Morgan's law. We have to distribute the knots, right? So that will be not P or not R, uh, sorry, not P or not Q or R, and then we try to remove this grouping because both are ors, so we use associativity. That will be not P or not Q or R, so this is already in conjunctive normal form. About this other premise, Q or S implies Q. So this is Q or S implies Q. We use material implication once again, not quantity Q or S or Q. And then we use De Morgan's law, not Q and not S or Q. And now we try to distribute this one, or over end. So this will be not Q or Q. So let me use this pen again just to show you how to do it. So we distribute this Q and this OR to this. So this will be not Q or Q. And then we distribute this to not S. So 
now this will be not s or q. And then we connect these two statements with an end, with the one inside the parenthesis. That's distributive law, right? So now we have not q or q and not s or q. What do we do next? We see here that not q or q is an inverse. So we turn it into a true using inverse. So true and not s or q. And as we can see, this can be an identity. So we now have not s or q. We can just remove the parentheses using associativity and we're done. Now let's look at the revised premises, not R, P, not P or not Q or R. This is in conjunctive normal form, not S or Q in CNF once again, and S. Now this is the resolution tree. You can, you know, create the resolution tree any way you want. Some do it from top to bottom, some do it from bottom to top. In this example, it's just easy using the, uh, in PowerPoint to, uh, to make it from right to left. But uh, it's easy, you know, uh, it's more logical to use left to right. So this is the first step. We try to match these two. Now, as you can see, using the resolution rule, you have not Q here and Q here. So you cancel them out. I'll try to use my pen again. You cancel them out. And what do we have? It'll be not P or R or not S. Now we also look for something to cancel out here. So let's look for a premise. We found P. So let's put them together and cancel not P and P out. So that's number two. So now we have R or not S. We try to find something to cancel something out. We found not R here. So we put them together and this is step three. We put them together and cancel them out. Finally, we have not S. And not S can have a contradiction by merging it with S. So now that we have a contradiction, we have also proven that the given argument is valid. We now used the proof of resolution. I hope that you were able to get this and keep on practicing by using the examples in the book. I hope you've learned uh, from this small lecture video. And here are some announcements. As you can see, here's the map and the schedule of the storm. I know that some of you are from the north and it will be unfair for you that the quiz will happen tomorrow and uh, some of you might have uh, experienced blackouts and you won't be able to take it. So I have advised Surgeon June to move the deadline of the quiz or the closing of the quiz to Wednesday. I think that after a day or two, the power will be back again, hopefully. Now, if it's still not back, then you can email us and we'll do something for you. Okay, stay safe and see you again next time. Bye.